whatever. Intros first. On time. You're good. Yeah. Just tell me when before I sneeze. Are we live? Yeah. Oh, we're live! <laughs> Sorry. It takes us a while. I was waiting to sneeze. <gasps> so excited. We're here today. Um, slightly different kind of topic than we've had in some of our others, but really want to dig into um, a topic that is really important to 23andMe, and that is our Parkinson's disease research. So I'm blessed to have here uh, Paul and Carl. Um, who lead up a lot of our Parkinson's initiatives. Um, Paul joined us back in 2011? Um, no, 2014. 2014, 2014 um, and has been leading up the Parkinson's initiative broadly, helping us think through a number of things that we're doing. Um, Paul, ironically, actually came to us um, with a pretty deep scientific background. So has a PhD and had actually been running a lot of neuro you know, neurodegenerative um, research at Roche for about 10 years. In Palo Alto. In Palo Alto. And um, so actually knew the category really well and, um, and then was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease himself in 2011. So it was really a perfect match because he actually has the science understanding, the drug discovery understanding, as well as now understands it from what it's actually like from the from a patient perspective. And so for us, we've always thought about Parkinson's as something where like we want to improve the patient experience, we want to really understand like the fundamentals of the biology, and then we also really want to have an impact on drug discovery and see can we do something. So Carl, Carl joined us, he has many talents, although I just discovered that he doesn't, can't sing Stop in the Name of Love which we're gonna work on. Um, <laughs> but Carl's very musical in other ways, but he actually came here to finish his, he has also has his PhD from Oxford, um, and came here to do his postdoc in Parkinson's and has been leading up a lot of our really interesting research initiatives and has now joined 23andMe full time because we will never let him go. That's what happens in here, it's a very yeah. sticky company. <laughs> um, <laughs> and like I said, he also writes some really phenomenal genetics-based music, which we really, <laughs> We have not. We should do. We should do a, a twenty-three minute live on that too. Perfect. Um, <laughs> so we're really excited. We started the Parkinson's community just as background for people. We started the Parkinson's community um, almost since inception of this company because my mother-in-law has Parkinson's. My former mother-in-law has Parkinson's disease, and we. It was right around the time that we started Twenty Three Me that we learned that there was a genetic mutation associated with Parkinson's. And I was told, like, well, you know, there's no reason to get tested because it's so unlikely that your family would have a Parkinson's, you know, have this mutation. It's very rare. Um, and, of course, like, what happens? Like, no, my mother-in-law doesn't have one copy of that mutation. She has two. And it was really, it was the first time it had been seen, really, that there was somebody with two copies of that mutation. Um, um, you know, the father of my children, Sergey, he has one copy. He wrote a blog post about it. Um, so, so suddenly it became very important to me personally, and it was a really interesting genetics discovery. And it was kind of one of those first areas where we could pilot, like, how do we leverage the power of the crowds and the communities to come together and really, like, can we actually pioneer something um, significant on genetics research in this disease area that's often underfunded. So we've been partnered with Michael J. Fox almost since the beginning. And it's, you know, we originally said we want 10,000 people with Parkinson's disease. We're now over 10,000 people. Um, we also have one of the largest communities of people with this specific genetic variant called LERC2 and um, have people with that specific genetic variant who either have the disease or are genetically high risk for that disease. So there's a lot of really interesting research that we have pioneered with this community and in some ways this, um, you know, there's almost a lot about the beginning of this company and the beginning of a lot of our disease research that um, kind of went hand in hand um, because a lot of these things we've tested out on the Parkinson's community is like, are people interested in contributing online? Um, you know, how much will they contribute? Um, you know, what other, you know, s types of samples can we get? We've done, we have a microbiome study that we're doing. We've done uh, medical records. Today. Oh, we launched it today? Yeah. Oh, good. Look, uh, fortuitous timing. Do we plan that? No. Um, so, oh, <laughs> good job, Paul. Um, so, so there's a lot that is happening. This is a really important community to us. So with that, um, we'll take it away with questions. questions. Okay, when did 23andMe launch the Parkinson's disease report? Um, and furthermore, why provide a report on a condition there is no known cure for? Oh, that's a great question. So 
like I said, I felt um, like I feel like this is in some ways like a very personal question for me because we um, I was told specifically there was no reason why I would want this information. And I went through like they also tried to counsel me in that way. Like, oh, well, what would you do? Like, there's nothing you can do. And I feel like that question of like, there's nothing you can do is a personal choice. And um, I, in my opinion, there's lots I can do. Like I can participate in research. I can be super proactive in my lifestyle. Every day there's an article coming out about the long-term benefits of exercise, of what you eat, um, you know, coffee the consumption. coffee consumption, <laughs> all kinds of things. And so it impacts your life. And it was one of those things like when, when Sergey, um, Mike's husband, when he first found out, he was like, oh, wow, like I need to start drinking coffee. Let's buy a coffee machine. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I think those types of things, like there's a lot, even if there's not a medication, like the beauty for me of genetics and environment is this belief that like there's genes and environment. So there's things that you can do, control within your environment. What is it that you can potentially do that's gonna potentially decrease those risks? It's partly, I think, the traditional medical system. You have to stand up, Mark. <laughs> the traditional medical system thinks about people being sick only. Mm-hmm. The majority of people who carry that risk gene actually will die without ever getting PD. Right. There's 30% rate. 70% of them will actually never get PD. Right. And so why? You know, we right. try and send that group because maybe there's something they're doing that's different. If everybody could do it, it may slow down the whole disease. And that's one way to get at it is to detect people early and intervene and, or at least work with them initially to see what interventions might work right. and which ones won't, but at least give them some idea of this is how to keep your brain healthy and so you can stay healthy longer. Uh, and that you can do, but you only do it if you know you're at risk. Right. And that's why the test, I think, is really important for people. I think that's one thing I've also learned is that like for people to see something in black and white motivates them to drive behavior changes. Like Everyone knows not to, you know, to exercise, don't smoke, eat well. But it's really different when it's something that's in your DNA and you get a report back. And so, and I think, Paul, you're right, like 70, you know, 70% of people who have this mutation or even higher don't get Parkinson's. So, like, clearly, what are they, like, there's clearly things either modify our genes or there's other things that they're doing that decrease their risk. And so that's, for me, this huge opportunity that we can actually make discoveries about, like, well, well what is it? And that's, to me, the story of hope. Anything to add, Carl? No, that's great. <laughs> you just say I'm perfect? No, perfect. <laughs> so uh, this is a, another question. Um, I hear there's a Parkinson's research community at 23 and Me. You've mm-hmm. talked a little bit about that. Um, can you talk more about the work that you guys do in that community? Sure. Um, i let you take it. Sure. sure. Um, well, Paul's done a lot of this work uh, engaging our, our PD research community. It's the oldest research community that we have at 23 and maybe started in 2009. And uh, you mentioned we have over 10,000 people. That, the number's grown actually quite a lot. And um, I'm not sure what the, the most up-to-date official numbers that we have are, but um, we've got a very large cohort of uh, genotyped individuals that we can do research on. Um, can talk more about the specific research that we've been doing if you're interested. Mm-hmm. Sure. So, I mean, uh, during my postdoc here, we uh, obviously wanted to have a big focus on genetics. And because science is a very collaborative uh, process, especially when it comes to doing these sorts of genetic studies, we've been working with other groups uh, to pool our data with other data to try to find genetic variants that are associated with Parkinson's disease. Um, particularly in collaboration with the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium. And so, you know, we published our first genome-wide association study for Parkinson's in 2011, and I think we found a handful of hits. And now we've just put something out on BioArchive that hasn't been peer-reviewed yet, but we're up to 78 different genetic regions throughout the genome uh, with 90 different independent variants now that uh, that we've uh, identified, which is really important because uh, we have evidence that uh, regions of the genome that are associated with genetic risk of disease are more likely to be better drug targets, and so this is potentially some way in which our research can help potentially one day benefit uh, patients. I think historically as well we've had this advantage that um, controls. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody who studied PD had PD cases. Mm-hmm. But none of them really had genotyped controls, because why would they? Right. It's changing a bit now, of course, with the advent of high-throughput next-generation sequencing in large cohorts. 
But for a long time, 23andMe was really the major contributor to a lot of these studies in terms of just having controls. People we knew didn't have PD, right. they'd been genotyped. Really very valuable for the community. A lot of work would never have happened in the time frame it happened without us being able to contribute that aspect of it. So not just people with PD, it's all the other people who do research with us. Mm-hmm. And actually, their genotypes can be very helpful for the mm-hmm. broader community because it's a s- well-characterized control population. So that's one big thing that we try to do is we try to always collaborate with researchers on a lot of people come to us asking specifically for controls because we have you know roughly 10 million people who've spat now um, or who've purchased kits and... Um, we have lots of people who have said specifically that they do not have a disease, and that's oftentimes one of those things. A lot of scientists go and say, I'm just going to study Parkinson's, um, but they don't necessarily have those controls. So that's mm-hmm. actually something, you know, again, as like Parkinson's really led this aspect of our, of our, as we thought about research, is like it's very important for 23andMe to collaborate with other researchers out there. If we really want to dramatically accelerate the pace of research worldwide, <laughs> then we have to be able to, you know, figure out ways that we can collaborate and help accelerate all kinds of researchers around the world. And controls, um, meaning people who do not have the disease, is one of the really interesting ways that we can actually help researchers around the world in all disease areas study their diseases. I think the other thing, too, with Parkinson's, it's great for people, uh, for the community, but for color, it makes their life difficult. It's actually relatively rare. Mm -hmm. 1% of people over 60. That's not a lot of people in the population to work with, so... You really have to collaborate. It's a, it's a numbers game, and you know we've had great partners through the IPDGC that Carl talked about, MJFF right. and others. And so I think it's in the past been a really strong aspect of the program. Again, it's, it's a collaborative program. Right. How is 23andMe working with the Michael J. Fox Foundation to further Parkinson's disease research? I'll maybe start with that yes, one. Sir. It's an extensive collaboration. As Anne said, they originally helped us grow the community back in the distant past and mm-hmm. they, they, other people were very helpful in that but more recently we and they both decided we wanted to look at people longitudinally which is over time to understand what predictors of progression because everybody's very different with Parkinson's every person who has Parkinson's has almost unique experience of the disease both in terms of the symptoms they have how they respond to medication positively and negatively and how that changes over time and so we were getting ready to do that after I joined that was one of the things I sort of saw we needed of course mm-hmm. it turns out Michael J. Fox is doing exactly the same thing. So that became very clear we should collaborate and not compete. It's the same group of people we're going to be targeting and the same answers. And so basically we've worked with them since the end of, I think you signed that contract, December 2015, Mm -hmm. just before the end of the year. Mm -hmm. It's a very broad collaboration. Uh, One big part of that was they have a program called Fox Insight. Mm -hmm. We now have a genetic sub-study in that where we and they work together and we're, we're actually genotyping people with Parkinson's and those people with genotype will be followed. Fox Insight will have more people overall, but about 14,000 new people, I think, will be genotyped and added to our collection and theirs. They'll have the genotype, and that data will be made sort of fairly broadly available um, to the research community, and that's in progress. And um, But the other part of it was to look at the existing data that we had, and that's really what Carl was brought into as a, as a postdoc, funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation, mm-hmm. to dive into the data that we had, find collaborators, and I think maybe they can tell us about some of your discoveries. <laughs> sure, yeah. So... You know, at the time when I came to 23andMe, we had collected tons of data. We had all these online surveys. We had a lot of genetic information. But what really was necessary was to put it all together, have somebody go through it, and start to analyze these data and build a network of collaborators and and start seeing what we could find. So um, there's a number of different uh, projects that we've undertaken. We kind of sent out a, a c- call for uh, requests for proposals to thousands of researchers across the world and reviewed tons of these and, and ended up setting up, I think, probably close to 10 partnerships or so as a result of this um, and beginning to build up our, our research efforts in that area so that we have uh, you know, the, the scientific communities thinking about us when they're, when they're thinking about doing the sorts of things that we'd love to be able to contribute to. Um, one of the really, you know, I, I talked about genetics earlier. Obviously, that's something that, that we can do very well. Uh, but uh, something else that we can do that uh, was kind of uh, untouched past or at that point, too, was to look at all this survey data that we pull in and to take uh, people's responses to online surveys. And instead of looking for genetic variants that associate with Parkinson's, to look with online survey responses that associate with Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. And so we just published a paper on that uh, a month ago in Nature Partner Journal's Parkinson's disease, looking at uh, all the different uh, phenotypes, we call them, that are associated with Parkinson's disease in our database. 
And what were some of those phenotypes? <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's there's 122 highly significant independent associations that we wow. found. I think you know one of the things that really impressed me is that you know this is a disease of the nervous system, and your nerves do so much in your body. You know, so we found associations with personality traits, with uh, you know obviously movement and motor control, but there's also your nerves control the movement of other parts of your body that is involuntary, like you know your heartbeat and things like that as well. Um, so you know we we found uh, kind of dysregulation of sweat glands and uh, tear 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 ducts as well and things like that. We found associations with um, sleep. Obviously, mm -hmm. sleep is very important for Parkinson's and is also something that's controlled by your nervous system. Um, so, you know, many, many things, psychiatric traits, which are well known to associate with Parkinson's disease, other neurological conditions, mm -hmm. things like that. I think one thing we should also emphasize is that um, part of this collaboration we have with Michael J. Fox is for people who actually have Parkinson's, um, they can go to the Michael J. Fox website and they can find us as a, as a you know, as one of their trials and they are eligible then for free kits uh, for, through 23andMe. So, so that's one thing that we're doing is we're actively still recruiting into the community and for people who have the specific, the LERC2 mutation, we also then send out um, free kits then to those family members. So that's one thing that's just important. A lot of people come to me and say like, oh, I have my father-in-law or I have a family member with Parkinson's. They can actually, they're eligible then for a kit. This is a two-part question. Okay. So John from Facebook wants um, you to explain the coffee link you guys mentioned coffee oh, earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then ER from YouTube would like to know, is it true that smoking decreases uh, Parkinson's disease, the risk of getting Parkinson's disease? Sure. Should we take the coffee one, Carl? I'll take the smoking one. Sure, yeah. So there is, you know, if you look at the epidemiological literature, there have been uh, tons and tons of studies that have kind of shown conclusively that one of the main uh, phenotypes that are associ that's associated with Parkinson's disease is reduced caffeine intake. Um, and we aren't entirely sure what the link there is. Obviously, the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, is coffee protective? Or is it something about being predisposed to Parkinson's disease that means that you are less likely to consume coffee? So this reverse causation right. hypothesis, you know, um, Parkinson's disease involves the death of neurons in the brain that produce dopamine, which is this neurotransmitter that's involved in many things, but one of them is reward. And obviously many people who drink coffee would definitely consider this to be a reward in the morning. <laughs> so it maybe it might be that uh, there's something to going on with uh, this population of neurons that, that's involved with in, in reward that is uh, predictive of not enjoying coffee as much, perhaps. So we really don't know. Um, so it's been very difficult to try to actually disentangle uh, the causal relationship despite mm -hmm. a very strong correlation. So it's really um, what gives uh, a lot of uh, support to that notion that correlation doesn't always equal causation. There's a lot of people who've, who've tried to see whether or not they're related. And there have been some clinical trials that have tried giving caffeine to people with Parkinson's, but uh, sadly, none of them have had Maybe, the outcome yeah. that we would have hoped for, and it, it looks unlikely that this will be something that will be pursued further because just the, the sample sizes we'd need would be too large, we think. I mean, there are adenosine receptor molecules as well in trials, um, particularly in Japan for some reason. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a genetic link there, but yeah, the, the results have been particularly spectacular with those sides. It's a small effect. Mm -hmm. it's Epidemiology is cast this time and time again. They come up. The same as it was true with the smoking, and probably still is true epidemiologically. So there's an inverse relationship. If you smoke, you seem to have less likely to get Parkinson's. It's not just you die earlier. That would be the simple explanation, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the reason you don't see it is because Parkinson's is a really very age dependent disease. It's really rare to have Parkinson's before 40. There's a percentage of us, including myself, you get diagnosed before 50. Most people, it's you know, 60 onwards, and so there's some things that could be protective just by making sure you don't make it to 60. Right. So that's not the case here, but there's a lot of work this year that came out recently where they've been studying people for a long time, and your progression is much worse if you smoke, and mm. the outcome is far worse. Your decline rate is much worse. You lose your cognitive 
abilities much faster if you smoke while you have Parkinson's. Oh, that's interesting. And so the, the story is now, don't smoke if you <laughs> still. It's not good for you. It might start, reduce your chances of getting it, but when you get it, you'll be in real trouble. Mm-hmm. And it seems to be a history of smoking, not even current smoking, that leads you down that path as well. Mm-hmm. So the, the medical profession would be the big sigh of relief, and Parkinson's yeah. is not the outlier. Yeah. It's not something that's good for you. Smoking isn't good for it. And there's evidence that people who go on to develop Parkinson's found it easier to quit smoking if they were smokers previously. So it's potentially suggesting that it, it might also be this reward system and this, this potentially reverse mm-hmm. causation as well. Don't smoke, kids. Yeah. <laughs> Final message, yes. <laughs> Anna from Instagram would like to know um, if 23andMe will be doing additional research and adding reports for any other Parkinson's genes. Yes, <laughs> I mean, we're doing the research, right? <laughs> and the challenge is, though, is getting to the level of proof of the... Inf- so there's research information where we have an association. We think it's real, and it gives us a certain degree of confidence to go ahead and do research projects. Mm-hmm. The level of confidence that you need for a report is much higher. Yes, right. And as and when different genes and those I get to that point, we'll look at putting out reports. Clearly, it's something we want to do, but the data has to be there to a level that's appropriate. Right, so that's one of the differences sometimes we have with research, like what we put out for research, and that's in a publication, and it's one of the reasons why we emphasize that like not everything that is published makes it into a report, because the, the bar that we have for telling someone, like, like, hey, here's your risk prediction for Parkinson's disease, um, we take that very seriously, and we want to know that that's you know it's been replicated. It's you know it's it's big studies um, that we feel really confident with the the you know the reports that we're putting out. Mm-hmm. So for us, the research is almost step one. Um, at Twenty Three and Me, we have a whole product team called Product Science, and the product science team is dedicated just to saying like, what are the next reports we're going to put out and do those actually meet our scientific criteria? So we have white papers out there about what our scientific criteria is, but this is something more and more is that we'll be looking at you know, these types of diseases and saying, hey, this is not, you know, very few diseases are one gene, mm-hmm. that they're sort of, you know, the accumulation of the effect of, you know, thousands of genes. And so what is that kind of score that we can actually start to give to people? So I think yeah. more and more we'll start to see what those types of reports coming out. Yeah. But again, we're cautious about it because we recognize the impact. Like people want to, people take this information seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, so we want to make sure that we, you know, have done the appropriate validation and the appropriate work to, to put this out to customers. Yeah. From, from the research side, we, in collaboration with the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium, we recently put a, a manuscript available online that also hasn't been peer reviewed yet. Um, but we showed that using this aggregated data from various data sources, uh, kind of the best that we're able to do right now is to. Uh, if you take one population of people and and you study their genetics and then you try to build a predictive model that you can then apply to a a left out population and see what percentage of the uh, genetics of Parkinson's can you explain. We think with our best models right now, we're hitting somewhere between 20 and 30%. So it's it's quite a substantial amount, but clearly a long way to go. go. Last question. Getting there. Okay. (laughs) Um, okay, I don't have Parkinson's disease, mm-hmm. but I found out through 23andMe that I'm a carrier of a genetic variant associated with the disease. Can I contribute to any of your research efforts? Definitely. It's an area very interesting. I think we spoke a bit about this earlier, this idea of prevention, right? Because currently, when you, when you get diagnosed with Parkinson's, especially for people who don't get caught early, there's a lot of damage already done. I mean, you've basically lost 50 to 80% of the neurons in your brainstem at that point. Well, that's not a good place to start. And so to get earlier, we really do need to be working. So let me step back a bit. Some of the the key things we can learn from studying people with Parkinson's, mechanisms that contribute to disease, environmental public health things that we could actually maybe do to reduce incidence of disease, but then also trying to help us identify people earlier on. What are the signs? Who's who's more at risk? If you have genetic risk plus features, are there early features of disease, such as Carl talked about, his associations? Do any of those help us find people who are much more likely to get the disease than others and would therefore be worth studying and working with those individuals to say, can we intervene with you? So there's a, there's a big project going on here with the carriers of the alert 2 mutation we talked about. We have another, and the other gene in the report is also, it should be coming up soon, so if people haven't heard from us yet, 
keep an eye on your inbox. I think we might be asking you to help us out. And basically, we're going to have a very broad research collaboration with the carriers at risk. So we're now shifting, evolving from just looking at people with Parkinson's, now people at risk of Parkinson's, to say, who's most risk and what can we do with those people? And I've also got a really good interest in looking at people like survivors or superstars. Who's got a lot of risk factors plus 85? Mm -hmm. you know, why did they get there? How? Is it luck? Mm -hmm. Maybe. But maybe there's genetics involved in there too. Mm -hmm. And so all of that involves people with the, the gene who don't have the disease working with us. And so far, they've been really great. Our response for people who have been asked to participate is very good. And there's a whole slew of research activities for that group coming. Mm -hmm. So yes. Great. That's all the time we have. So that was the last <laughs> oh, that question. Was the last <laughs> question. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought we were running over. <laughs> Thanks so much, guys. That was really Thank you. So anyone, Thanks. I think just to sort of like to, to close it out is, I, again, just want to emphasize like for people who are who do know have family members or have Parkinson's themselves um, to go to the Michael J. Fox website or you can go to our website and you can actually see there's easy ways for people to join the 23andMe community. And part of it for us is like there's a big team here dedicated to making sure like can we actually, you know, make discoveries that are going to have a scientific impact for you. And so part of it for us is like, again, there's some of the basic biology, um, understanding, you know, can we actually ever develop a therapy for it that's gonna have a meaningful impact for people? Um, and the thing that I care the most about is like, are there ways to, you know, actually prevent? So for everybody who has Parkinson's disease, they obviously care about how, like having a treatment and a cure for themselves, but they also think about family members and others. Like, are there things that we could have done to prevent? And so that's what I think, you know, a lot of what um, the mission of 23andMe is, is understanding those environmental impacts or behaviors or, again, modifier genes, like, that will help theoretically um, prevent diseases. So people can, again, people with diseases obviously can participate. People who do not have the disease can participate, like we said, about being controls. So I would just encourage you to look at the website or the Michael J. Fox. Um, Michael J. Fox has truly been a spectacular partner. Um, and it's one of those groups, again, I think when people have the disease and they really understand it and he's, you know, Michael's been putting his effort into, you know, really having an impact on, on the disease. And like I said, it's an incredibly well-run organization. Um, so I've been impressed with that, what they've done. Yeah, they've basically changed the science in PD research. Yeah. Through funding and through their own contributions. It's really quite amazing. It's, it's amazing what you can do. And this is, again, when I think about, like, the first question that we got here is, like, why, like, why do you want to learn about a disease when there's nothing you can do? And there's one thing that I've learned in running this company for 13 years is that when people find out about something, they want to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have Michael J. Fox. That's why you, you have these change makers. You have, you know, Livestrong and Susan G. Komen and all these groups. Like, people want to make a difference. And so for us, part of it is, like, having that platform um, to enable people to learn about a risk factor and take charge and do something. And the, the reality for me is like the knowledge is within all of us. We just all have to come together. So that's what's exciting for me about the Parkinson's community because it's the first community where we showed, holy cow, these people all want to come together. And, um, and we're trying to make a difference here. So thank you. And thanks, thanks you guys for joining. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.